Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Our series of film professionals reviewing Oscar nominees continues here at Below the Line. Regular listeners, I hope you're enjoying it. And if you're new to the podcast, you've still got all week to catch up before the 94th Academy Awards on March 27th. Today is episode 9 of 10, and we're talking about visual effects. My first guest is returning to the show. Kent Secchi, your visual effects credits include The Matrix Revolutions, Superman Returns, and Iron Man. Nice to have you back. It's great to be back, Skid. Thanks for having me. And joining us for the first time is Chris Batty. Chris, your recent credits include A Wrinkle in Time, Creed II, and Aquaman. But there's a ton of other stuff I could have named because you've been doing this for about 20 years. Welcome to Below the Line. Thanks. Excited to be here. Excited to have you both. Listeners, if you'd like to see what I'm talking about in terms of credits, look these guys up on the Internet Movie Database. If you start on the Below the Line page, you can simply click on the names of my guests. The five films nominated for visual effects are Dune, Free Guy, No Time to Die, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, and Spider-Man No Way Home. We're going to discuss them in that order, and spoilers are possible, so consider this a warning. And a side note, the Academy shares names, but doesn't include job titles with the nominations. I've pulled the job titles from IMDb, and I can't guarantee their accuracy. Also, apologies in advance if I mispronounce any names. First up is Dune. Visual effects supervisor Paul Lambert. Visual effects supervisor for D-Neg Tristan Miles. Visual effects supervisor for D-Neg Brian Connor. And special effects supervisor Gerd Nefser. So for me, Dune is one of those amazing big screen experiences. And as of recent, I have been craving those experiences. And you know it when you see it both on television, whether it's streaming and then on the big screen. I know that Chris saw it on IMAX. I'm pretty sure, Skid, you saw it on IMAX uh, twice, I think. I saw it once at a regular theater, once on IMAX, and a third time at my home TV so I could read the subtitles. Understood. I, so I, I, yeah. I have to confess that I noticed things in the, in the big screen experience of the details in the image that are just stunning that I did not pick up when I was watching even on my high quality television at home. Um, Chris, I think you probably saw it too in terms of when you were watching that film. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, this is one that just, it begs you to go to the theater. Like it's it's fully immersive, just epic in scale and, and, and the aesthetics just like goes through all the way down to the tiniest detail. Director Denis Villeneuve has a history of working on great VFX-driven films like Blade Runner 2049 and Arrival. Even Sicario had a large number of invisible effects. And I think his uh, experience making all those movies really come into play when making something like this where there's so much world building going on. I was super impressed at how photo real everything was in this movie. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's so design driven too. Um, you know, just everything it just all works seamlessly, you know, from the set design and set extensions to the to the, you know, the city scales and the spaceships and everything down to the costumes and the, you know, all the little bits in tech too. Uh it's really interesting like, you know, where the sort of the director is that sort of orchestrator of sort of gathering everything together and although you have you know, obviously, like several different vendors and, and you know, you know, and all, all the visual effects supervisors all pitch in, of course. But, you know, uh, Denis Villeneuve, he, he, you can just see it. It's it's like it definitely comes from a central like control of, of, of the whole design of everything. One of the interesting things about the visual effects for this film, and it's a term I had never heard before. Most uh, most people who work in VFX or even the tangential people who know of VFX-driven films, I've heard of blue screen and green screen. But this film used a thing called sand screen because the spill and contamination you get from green and blue screen that affects the actual image you don't want to key out is so big that they decided to use something that was more akin to the uh, the desert world of Arrakis. And they use these sand colored uh, screens instead of blue and green screen. And I think that it's super effective in integrating the CG aspects of it with the practical. 
I think it has a lot to do because, you know, obviously with a movie called Dune, like the sand and the dust is almost like a character in this, right? And so as, you know, can you know from your experiences as well, like dust and atmosphere and everything with green screen or blue screen is like, can be a killer. So if you kind of lean into that and have everything of that same tone and giving you know, the whole world of Iraq is kind of a wash in that same tone. Like you say, you get all the reflections and the light kicks and all that stuff. And you don't have to worry about all the crazy spills and stuff and trying to get rid of the, the green and, and all that with, through the dust and atmosphere. You can kind of lean into it. Yeah. I, I think that when you look at the film, even the way that it's shot, it's shot in almost a very practical manner. All of those shots of the ornithopters in the air, they shot a ton of helicopter footage, helicopter to helicopter, which really grounds the camera work and just replaced the actual practical helicopter with the ornithopter. They built two 12 ton ornithopters, practical ones to have on set. Um, they even had one on a, on a pretty a substantial gimbal on a hill in uh, I think Budapest is where they started. And they found that a, the highest place they could find in the city of Budapest, like was like on a hill. And they built this practical psych all the way around it, which used like this uh, tan colored bottom along with a sky colored top, almost a grad across it. And when the VFX artists got it, they didn't have to do too much keying out. In fact, the natural reflections they got in the windows and the glass, they were just able to blend the CG version of it into it. And I think that created that grounding that you really want. You know, the other thing that you notice with these kinds of films when they do this type of thing is how much it affects the actors to have something that looks like the real thing there. Like all the practical stuff, it really helps it become un-CG and it's really, really super effective. Uh, they take time to build the, the, these, these things and they're not simple to build. And then they took the color that they liked so much and they went on location to these other locations and they had to truck in this special sand to match the color they decided on in Budapest. And the, uh, the special effects uh, supervisor was responsible for all the practical effects uh, Gerd Nevzer deserves a lot of credit for bringing in, it wasn't all just sand. They brought in special dust to, 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 to look like the sand. And you can imagine having sand and dust blowing around does murder to your equipment that's out there. And to maintain all of the plate shakers, like they had a lot of plate shakers and practical dust explosions that they enhanced in CG. I think gave them a great technical base to start with, which is one of the reasons why this movie grounds so well in its, in its visual effects. In terms of like the uh, actual, some of the other effects, the, the uh, shielding effect I thought was particularly interesting. If you watch the attack, the Arakeen attack, for example, you can see the shields around various spaceships or buildings. And as they get penetrated, the explosion stays contained within that shield. It's a great effect. That it's something you don't really see. And I think that's something that like, should be noted is the color also, a uh, use of color there contrasting with the sort of more muted tones really makes it stand out. I, I found that to be really mesmerizing in a way that um, was an, an effective use of CG with the practical, which I thought was a, a, a fantastic combination of things that, that was used throughout this film. Uh, was well, they knew when to go to CG and they knew when to use the practical stuff. And I, I think using the practical is a movement that's been happening for some time in filmmaking, which I've, I'm really actually psyched to see because it's a bit of a throwback in a lot of ways. But I remember the first time I saw it or heard of it was on um, the film. What was the film that had Tom Cruise in it and he played, it was in the future where he oh, was- Oh, in... Oblivion. I was just going to mention that because when you're talking about like the uh, ornithopters and the sets, it's very much- it's very much the same strategy they use because they built that flying vehicle that Tom Cruise had. And right. it's a gorgeous design, but they built as much as they could practically. And in that one, they use all those LED screens to get all the, the right reflections and everything. So that as you look out, you have like the CG plates, um, you know, with Arrakis, it's a little bit more forgiving because th there's a, that sort of constant tone of the, of, of the desert there. And so, it's it's a very very similar strategy, but just sort of, you know, updated. Yeah, it's interesting that you know that that is so Oblivion used LED screens, and you see the 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 sort of genesis of it now in the Mandalorian. But even here, they used 
almost a poor man's version with these sand screens and with these sort of matte painted large psychs. And I, it's super effective. Um, and it should be noted that, it, you know, we think of Dune and we think of sand world, but there's actually several other worlds. There's the world of Kaladin, which is kind of a gray over, uh, which has a lot of overcast and some rain. There's uh, Seleucus, which, which is, you know, a different world entirely. And Kitty Prime, which is more toxic. There's, so they, they have these various different worlds that like have different color palettes, which I think makes Arrakis really stand out in its in this look. So I, I, I'm always blown away. There's 1700 visual effects shots of which most are augmentation. I mean, I think they picked their moments when to go full CG. And it's, uh, I, I was absolutely blown away. And we haven't even gotten to the sandworm effect, which is just another one. I know it's, it's, it's like, um... It's always a question of scale when it comes to those things, whether it's sand simulation, water simulation, and water simulation we can get into later on some of the other stuff. But it's um, that's the hardest thing to sell because you know usually you would try to do that with miniatures and the and you know twenty thirty years ago and that's always the big giveaway. Yep. And trying to just get that to mix with CG and the and the practical foregrounds that they had um, is really really convincing, especially when you're trying to do this on IMAX. Right, right. You you pick up every single sort of bad detail. The uh, the sand plate shakers that the uh, that Gerd Nefzer made were absolutely amazing. Like when you feel the approach of the sandworm and the vibrating ground, the actors are actually really sinking into the sand, and because of the sand effects, and a lot of times other movies would have used just simulation and it just wouldn't look the same and you wouldn't get the performance. I think it's something that's really, you know, something that a, a lot of other movies don't take into account is the performance of the actor, how important it is to sell the effect that's happening. And I think if you look at Dune, it's firing on all cylinders. Now, all of these films in the team that's been nominated have one person who's listed as special effects. But is that more of a recent development that there is a person on that team? You mentioned, Kent, that people are moving back in that direction to doing, I, I wouldn't say trying to do more practical or visual, but rather it sounds like to have practical integrate properly with the visual. Yeah. You know, to, to be honest, Skid, I think it's, I think since the category existed, they've had, they've known the importance of special effects and it's almost an unwritten tradition that one person out of the four is a practical effects person and i think that's a great tradition because all of the best films have some practical effects in them from a visual effects standpoint and it, it allows it allows it keeps people honest to be honest it's a, i think that that's one of the things about practical effects is it keeps the cg people honest it keeps the vfx soup honest and i can't stress enough like pyro and other things like this movie has great examples of both pyrotechnics and explosions and sand that if it's not practical would have really sort of hurt the film i think on a large scale yeah you just it wouldn't be as immersive it wouldn't be as you know eye-catching and realistic and even from a visual effects artist standpoint like if you have something to work from it's almost easier right if there's something in the frame whether it's a car or, you know, like these, the, the, the foreground sand, you have something to match to integrate with. And like you say, Ken, it just, it kind of keeps you honest and keeps the film more honest, right? you know, for the audience. When you talk about those details that were in that battle with the, not just the shields on the people, but the shields around the ships and the explosions inside, it also makes me think about how in a lot of these films, and I think some that we're gonna talk about on our list, the battle scene ends up being at the end of the movie. And sometimes it seems like maybe the visual effects go too far on this, but this battle is not at the end of the movie, probably at the end of the second act, right? Yeah. And then, right, right. And it's very important that it does not overwhelm the rest of the film or what's going to happen afterwards. But I didn't feel that way watching it. And I'm curious to what degree visual effects restraint plays a part of that. Oh, I think it's very easy to go overboard. I, I remember when I was a visual effects artist, I was always trying to create the spectacular shot. Like that was my goal was, oh, I want to make the, the coolest shot in the film. Like that's what I want to be responsible for. And I think when you have a director like Denis, he knows where to pick his moments and he knows what he wants things to be spectacular. And I think he has enough experience to be able to command all the departments 
And that's what allows them all to work together toward this common shared vision. I think, Chris, you said something very interesting at the beginning of the film about how every department seems to have talked to each other, even though you think that's a natural thing. So many films get finished in post where design happens with the visual effects vendor or with the visual effects supervisor. And I'm not saying they're not good at those things, but when you have, well, you want a cohesive vision throughout the whole process. And I think when you have a director like Denis, you get that vision and you get that communication that's shared throughout all of those departments. And it's very evident in this film. Also, just another thing as an aside, like going back to the, that battle, it's an interesting notion where you come up with certain rules for your world. And one of those in Dune is very famous is the shield and the slow blade penetrates the shield. Right. And so, and that's how you get that interesting visual of those, you know, when the ships blow up, they sh blow up sort of internalized, like the shield's still there. And so it's like using the rules of the world, which is this good writing, rules of the world, <laughs> and, and coming up with great visuals to express that thought, right? And then with a movie like Dune, you can just do it in such an epic scale and, and so strong a visual like that. And that, that's what's fun. And that's where visual effects really shine, right? Where you can kind of demonstrate what is different about this world. Why are we going to see this movie? Not just apart from character and story, but if you're gonna do a spectacle like this, that is the spectacle. Yeah, I think that's a really on point, Chris, as far as like the design of the visual effect supports the story. And then within that design, you can be spectacular and you don't get the overload of like so many things happening. It's very targeted and specific. I skated, it was a good, it was a good point about like this battle happens really, you know, not at the end of the film, but in sort of the middle of that, of, of, the, of, of the film. And, and it's super effective. I think that they did a, a fantastic job of making it seem big and epic, but at the same time, it felt realistic. Now you guys mentioned the worms and I'm not sure whether we really dove into that. Are there specific challenges or from a visual effects perspective, what do you see as the challenges with that kind of effect? From when I look at it from a visual effects standpoint, you have to communicate the scale of that worm and all the detail into it. So the CG model of that worm has to be constructed with the level of detail that you can see on a bigger screen. And then on top of that, the interaction with sand that is a nightmare. <laughs> I know that the tools have gotten much stronger since the time I was doing those kinds of things, but the amount of simulation you have to do that actually feeds into a plate that you shot that looks realistic with exploding dust, it's not simple. And a lot of it's based on fluid simulation there, and there's a lot of software that does that, but there's an artistry to that integration that makes because there's nothing in the world that that's, it's, that is that large. So your brain immediately says it's fake. Like, I think that there's something about something that big interacting with sand. You're like, I've never seen anything like that. There's nothing I can refer to that looks like that. And the fact that the physics don't actually work. Like, that's not, you can't displace that amount of earth, you know, with that mass. So the fact that that looks right is also a testament to the artists that are able to do that because, you know, you can't, do that, you know, in reality. So it's it's just a, it's a cool concept for science fiction um, to have that amount of heavy earth displaced like that from a creature that how how does it move through that depth of sand and people can still walk on it? Um, and so it's another kind of design challenge. You know, how do you make this look real? And you know, again, it goes all uh, goes back to all of that stuff. My last question, well until you guys say something else cool. But <laughs> you both talked about IMAX being a factor here. And other than scale or seeing on a large screen, what factors from a visual effects perspective come into play when you're talking about IMAX? One thing is just sort of resolution. Like you just have more square footage to fill. Um, and, and both the aspect ratio, which is the shape of the screen, but also just in the, the resolution itself of the image, the defini how much definition of the image there is compared to a normal screen just because of the size. Yeah. And so that has to hold through so it doesn't look too grainy and, and soft and kind of fall apart. And so I think one of the things uh, that you have to, to think about is like how you use that. And I think the way Denis Villeneuve used it is um, to kind of show off that sort of epicness and, and the almost like that 
sort of sublime experience of, of this planet. Because when you go to see it at an IMAX, you know, maybe half the film is IMAX. So the other half, which is on Caladan, the other planets and, and the more intimate moments and interior moments are sort of the normal widescreen aspect ratio that we're all used to if you go see like a Marvel movie or, or what have you. And then when you go outside to the exterior, the image just expands vertically and you're just, it just becomes just a lot more to, to sort of take in. Yeah. Um, so sort of conceptually there's that, but then, you know, you can't, you could can probably speak. I mean, the technical, from a technical perspective, you're rendering more pixels, meaning that once you've designed and built the effect, you have to make the picture, right? You have to make 24 images per, per second of that image and it's that it's a lot more expensive i i I, don't, I wouldn't i think it's almost exponentially more expensive as you get that much larger so you have to manage that process right you have to manage generating all those images and that becomes a technical uh difficulty of the, the lift becomes harder right because you can't render like it, it it's like a, it's 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 this size of the image the final image is much larger than a regular 2k image that is what you generate 2000 pixel uh image a 2048 image it just becomes that much more expensive on the baking of it you'll sometimes hear oh it's almost like a brag oh this took five days to render one frame you know like it's like some kind of badge of honor <laughs> but like at the end of the day that that's time that's less iterations that's more money if you want to get it done faster and you need the iteration time to to really know if the effect looks right well, I'm not a voting member of the Academy, and so I don't have to keep it secret. This is my favorite film of the year. I could keep talking about it this whole time, but that's not why we're here. That's not why folks have joined us. Let's, let's move on to the second film on okay. our list, Free Guy, production visual effects supervisor Sven Gilberg, visual effects supervisor for Scanline, Brian Grill, visual effects supervisor for Digital Domain, Nikos Kalitsidis, and production special effects supervisor, Dan Sudik. Dan is on this list twice, which is impressive. That yeah, he's, nice. too. he's like, he is a legend in the world of, uh, spe of special effects. And so we, I'm glad to see his name twice in there. So it's interesting that we're talking about Free Guy after Dune because Free Guy is a great example of a, another heavy shot film. There's 1,271 visual effects shots in the movie itself. It's a world building. It creates this idealized computer generated world. It's not trying to be, it's not trying to be photoreal in the sense of Dune, but it's trying to be photoreal, almost idealized photoreal as if a game engine had made it. And it's one step further than like Ready Player One, which I think is another good example of like world building and different world building. When you look at Free Guy, there are aspects of it that are photoreal, but there are aspects of it that are very cartoony. And so the balancing act of this movie is crazy. There's all of this idea of revealing how it's constructed. The world that it's made out of is a game. And so there's an interface UI design aspect of the, there's a heads up display aspect of it. There's a de-resing, deconstruction aspect of it. And it even permeates the camera work. If you take it from the opening shot of the movie and look at the camera work there, it's like a video game drop-in uh, like Fortnite where you fly down with a character into an, a situation. It's a cold open. Uh, there are 10 plates that have been stitched together with a ton of CG augmentation. The final shot is almost two minutes long. It's at 2,734 frames and it's totally virtual and it's not trying to be real. Whereas you compare that to Dune, which is grounded in the camera work, which is appropriate for Dune, this film is a, it's appropriate to have the CG camera work because it's a movie about it takes place inside a game. So it's fascinating to look at this. It's totally appropriate for this movie. But it's interesting that these two movies are going up against each other because it's a contrast of styles. Yeah, I can't. I mean, it, it's again, it's like another, like you said, it's like a world building exercise, but with just a different kind of tone and different different aesthetic totally and it's it's super interesting and then we should also mention at the end they had like a really interesting process for the sort of ryan reynolds 2.0 guy the dude <laughs> the dude <laughs> yeah. and the and and that that face replacement while it's not like 100 percent on but like for the movie it worked really well and it was well integrated and you know all the lighting matched 
in in the so the way that they sort of created that effect we should sort of get into as well i think you know what you're seeing now is the influence of the deep fake so for this film they used a proprietary tool called charlatan which is an appropriate name to do the cg channing tatum that that jumps down into that first big opening shot and it's fascinating to see something that was an internet sensation the deep fake become integrated into you know modern visual effects and there was a movement toward cg digi doubles in which everything was done with a model and it was rigged and face shapes were taken and photographs were taken of the actor but then to use deep fake as an alternate form i remember there was taste tests on the web comparing deep fake versus like the cg princess leia from rogue one which is again a few years old but like is worth talking about because that's the influence or that's how fast things change in visual effects. There was one direction made that before deep fake. And now it seems like all these companies are employing some kind of AI technology to do the face replacement over traditional face replacement techniques. And this is yet another great example where the, the results of the deep fake on Channing Tatum's character was so good. They used it more and more throughout this process. Now, Ken, I'm not sure I understand what the difference is between a deep fake and traditional face replacement or CGI character? So in the past, what you would do is you would scan the actor and take a lot of photographs in various different lighting conditions and try to recreate the face and then create literally some kind of animatable face where an artist would go in and move points like controls around to open the mouth or close the mouth, open the eyes, squint. And you would have to go through and have a very sophisticated rigor, what they call rigor, go in and create this face rig and then a an amazing character animator actually hand key the face to the performance based on reference. Deepfake uses uh, photographs that exist. So the, the still uses photographs, but then AI, you know, artificial intelligence technology to analyze the stand-in actor and replace that face with, with computer generated versions of the actor's face, which does still require artistry, but does rely more heavily on AI to make those choices. And it's, I, it's it's a scary thing because now you realize that anything can be deep faked. It used to be that you see a video, you could believe that video. But with the advent of this deep fake technology, you're really seeing it used. And there's other films in the list that do, that also use deep fake technology. And it's fascinating to me. Absolutely. And also at the same time, a bit terrifying. Yeah, this, it's, a little, you know, it's a little scary. But at least, you know, for this one, it, it serves sort of like a practical issue and that they had some story changes late in the game and, and Channing Tatum was unavailable. So they had him record audio for the new lines and then use this sort of deep fake charlatan uh, technology to build a performance. And they asked, they had to get all the footage they had of him, including, including like takes not used, long takes, or, you know, just any kind of uh, wasted footage so that the machine can just analyze it and see what they needed to do for Channing Tatum. So the director is Sean Levy, and he's a veteran director of visual effects films also. He had done the Night at the Museum series, Real Steel. He had directed a bunch of Stranger Things episodes. And I think it's another nod for me, at least from where I stand, to the director's role in all of these things. Because if a director is savvy and has worked on enough visual effects films, they know what's achievable. They know what they want to get in camera and they, they can t t tell a team how they want to shoot the film. He's famous for being very fast on set and having short days, short, fast days. And if you're that definitive in that experience, you can get away with that and you can allow your visual effects team to put their efforts where they need to and still get those days, which are easier on the crew and easier on the actors to have very targeted, fast shoot days. And I think it's something that a lot of people who look at visual effects don't really know about it is the more experienced the director is, the better the experience generally is for the visual effects team in sort of walking through that process. And you end up with a more cohesive vision. And in this case, they really do have this amazing, I think they start off looking at a lot and throughout this process, what I've from right they looked at a lot of games and there was a lot of discussion about photo reel versus cartoony. And my understanding is they started with photo reel more meaning more looks more like real life and then added more cartooniness to the animation and what was happening in the in the scenes and then dialed it back to more photo real so it rides this real weird this strange but appropriate middle line of 
oh, it's cartoony, but it's kind of real. So you can feel the jeopardy to the characters in that world. And I think that's super important that when you do create these virtual worlds, how how the jeopardy or the danger is for the characters that inhabit that world. You know, this it's funny because in this movie, there is this amazing car chase where the world sort of deconstructs around it. There's buildings collapsing. It's similar to the Ready Player One car chase, car race sequence where the world deconstructs around it. But the two are vastly different in, in their approach. Like Ready Player One embraces maybe one generation or two generations earlier of game technology in terms of its look. And this one is like full on photo real, like it looks way advanced, right? And so you have two different approaches to almost a similar problem, the metaverse problem, right? You're they, like, basically this film creates a metaverse of its own and it's a photo real metaverse in its rendering, but, but cartoony in its, some of its animation style. And it's fascinating because that's hard to do. It's hard to know that line. And I think they experimented a lot with that. And the virtual camera work is just an extension of that. There's a lot of these impossible camera moves and that virtual camera work, meaning only the camera done in the computer, which is obviously not tied to anything real. Nothing real could shoot it, not a gimbal, not a drone or a crane. Like it lends itself to this kind of film and it doesn't take you out because you know you're inside a game. I want to talk a little bit more about that line between the photo reel and the cartoony or game-like nature. The uninitiated may assume that because you could sort of lean on that game side, that the visual effects here are less of a lift than they are in, say, Dune or another movie that's going for photo reel. I wonder if you could speak more about achieving that balance and the difficulty compared to some of the other films we're going to talk about. In some ways, that could be a thought process behind it. But what I found in my experience is that something that's not photo reel is almost more difficult because you don't know what the target is. You know, you can look at something, a visual effect, and say, I don't believe it. But if you look at something and you still believe it, but it's not right, then you have to come up with the, with the descriptors to direct the visual effects artist to create the thing that you want. I work currently in, in, in an animation. And one of the hardest things to do in animation is a stylized effect, like an explosion or a, a, like a or or like fire that doesn't look like photo real fire because all the software are physics based and so they want to make something that looks real they're all based on real things right and so you're telling a piece of software that's designed to build something to look realistic to do something that's kind of realistic but not and that lift is very hard especially when you don't know what the target is it's one thing if you have a very specific idea, but a lot of times you enter into these scenarios and you don't know. And it, visual effects is constantly in this in this uh, arms race of doing new things, of like showing the audience the world something they've never seen before. And in the case of Dune, I think Chris eloquently talked about how the sandworm is impossible. So how do you make something that's impossible look real? That's a that's a heavy lift with interactive sand and real things around it. But taking a car, a video game and having Ryan Reynolds live in that video game and interact with it, but it should still feel like it's real and tangible. That's not easy either. Like that's a, that's a different hard lift. Like it's a lateral move, not an up and down move in my opinion uh, of in terms of level of difficulty. But then again, I, you know, that's my opinion about Chris. I don't know if you can speak to that of what you think about that question. I think it's a very good one. Again, it goes back to kind of like we say, what we're talking about and doing like as a visual effects artist, if you have something real in the frame to work off of, it's it's almost easier. So, yeah, if you don't have a roadmap to where you're going, um, you could get lost and, and the aesthetics could get jumpy. And also, even story wise, character wise, if Ryan Reynolds is running down the street and we feel for him, but then all of a sudden he just like bounces around, um, then it becomes, you know, like. A cartoon and we just we don't care any longer so it it is riding that line and i think they did that great at the end like when we we're talking about what the dude comes and fights him where you have both like they just like we're embracing this cartooniness but you still cared for the guy because not only is it you're not worried that he's going to get killed but there's just like this other ticking time bomb of the world kind of running out so you know you kind of maintain the drama in that way and so they he he can have his cake and eat it too when it comes to that, um, you know, that sort of realism versus the cartoonism. And it's just, it's really just sort of dramatically like how you thread that, thread that needle. 
I guess we should talk about the other process because I just don't want it to get mixed up between the charlatan and then the face replacement thing that they did in the egg. So it was just like when they did the Ryan Reynolds character, the dude character, you know, that that's also an interesting process, you know, because the charlatan is more of the probably what a lot of people have seen on the internet, which is like the deep fake is like the AI using found footage or, you know, library footage to kind of create a new performance. Uh, this one, they actually recorded Ryan Reynolds' face and put him onto another body. So for that that dude character, the big muscle bound guy was another actor, a bodybuilder, that he was there practically on set and they put little markers on his face so that they can later track it and understand what his head and face is doing. And then they bring Ryan Reynolds into the studio and they have this um, sort of capturing device, which is this a giant ball full of LEDs and you're on the inside and the inside shell is all 360 degrees of LEDs. So you can have basically any lighting circumstance that you want. Um, and so they can look at the footage and they've kind of recorded all the light within each shot and then they can probe that in, into the shell. And then Ryan Reynolds sits in the middle and there's cameras all around him. And then they get this like 360 view of his performance. And he's sitting there and this is very hard for the performer because it's, it has different marks in the shell and he has to hit the same marks as what's in the footage. And then later they can take that face that they've captured in 360 and then put it onto the, to the stunt performer. You know, it's very technical and it's technical for the actor uh, but they were again this is a comedy and there's a lot of funny moments <laughs> yeah. um and so it's a testament both to the actor but also you know the director but also the, the 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 effects artists you know the people running that and also putting it on there and so it was really well integrated and really effective i think in this circumstance that's a great point chris like there are multiple techniques for replacing the face right you just described another method you could create a cg digi double that's one method which I described earlier. There's this, you know, capture method you talked about of like doing it. There's the deep fake. And then there's also just traditional, like you just shoot them, shoot the actor in a similar position and try and warp it and 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 composite that face on there. So you have like now there's I mean, I just described four techniques to, to doing that same or approaching that same problem. And they're all they all have their merits and they're all have their sort of downside to each one of them. And they they cost differing amounts as well um for for that but that's that's definitely an area that's been expanding quite a bit uh, actually in the last probably 10 years yeah and i think what's novel about this particular circumstance is because usually they do that for very quick action shots so if you have let's say you're having a can of reeves get thrown from a motorcycle and you want to he gets kind of thrown it's very dangerous stunt so they don't use him but they kind of want to see his face so they would do that but it's only like 36 frames but this circumstance these are like long shots with dialogue. Right. And so the, the stunt performers, he has his inflections and he's trying to do the lines. And then you have to replace that with Ryan Reynolds later. And that's extremely difficult. And I think they, they really pulled it off for, for a long sequence too, with close close ups and, and all this stuff. And it's a, it's a good point about how long the shot is, Like right? The longer the shot, generally the more difficult that shot is because you're the audience is going to watch it and study it and see it. And so any of the nuances that, that like you know are not right, your eye will pick it up. And so the, there are a lot, there are quite a few long takes in this film that that's the nature of virtual camera work in general is the long take. And to see how much face replacement they did in it or to hear about it, it's pretty amazing. The third film on our list is No Time to Die. Visual effects supervisor, Charlie Noble. Visual effects supervisor for DNEG, Joel Green. Visual effects supervisor for Framestore, Jonathan Faulkner. And production special effects supervisor, Chris Corbold. The last of the Daniel Craig, James Bond movies. Uh, it's a testament to the movies themselves that these, this is probably the most sort of seamless visual effect movie. Like you see shots in this movie that you think are practical that are actually a visual effect shot. And you're not even really supposed to think about it. When you watch Dune, you know that Arrakis and there's not a giant sandworm and there isn't a giant city that's built there. Like you sort of know these things. Whereas in a movie like James Bond, they, they are really part of what's a James, what makes a James Bond film, James Bond from a visual effects standpoint is the integration of stunts, practical effects and visual effects. 
and the the ability for the audience to not know which is which to just sort of watch it and accept what's happening and this movie has it in spades for sure like it's all over this film in the stunts that they do and even in areas that which you're not even aware of the fact that there's there isn't a visual effect so the invisible effects in this one are are, are admirable and amazing uh in their in the way they got pulled off at least for me there is an amazing uh motorcycle jump into a plaza they actually did the jump like that's crazy it's got 100 foot i think it's like a 100 foot jump it's crazy <laughs> that they actually did the jump and then painted out the ramp and did all of like the only effect in there was the paint out like right that allowed it to like not but somebody some stunt person put their life on, on the line and made that 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 shot spectacular and i think that's one of the things about james bond that you that makes it exciting is that you do think most of it is practical i mean they had 10 aston martin db cars for this movie 10 right and one of them which is amazing when i see these things done is basically a, there's a pod on top of the hood of the on top of the top of the roof of the car where the driver there's a there was a famous rally car driver who was driving the car while Daniel Craig is inside acting like he's driving the car so that it would do the maneuvering that they wanted while they were shooting it. That's impressive. So they had to re-engineer the steering and the, you know, the braking and the acceleration of the car so that somebody else could be driving while Daniel Craig's in the actual driver's seat. Like that kind of stuff is, is amazing to me. Yeah, it's also just sort of interesting historically, like a James Bond film is nominated for visual effects. When, you know, when they first started, they were very adamant about like building all their sets you know in the fact that you know the studios in england and you know there's the james bond stage that's like one of the largest stage ever because because of that sort of philosophy and here we are now where it's sort of like become this like seamless you know integration between you know what they've done practically and and and, and visual effects you know but they still you know, it, it just, it still has this scope that the, it, that they always do with these, you know, it's always the villain layer, right? <laughs> right, the villain layer. And so that they're, they're sort of famous for, and, and this one has it, and it, it's just, it, and it's incredible. Like, it's just so well done. And so I, I just find that also interesting. There are a few things that I found out while you know, researching this movie a little bit that they did that I had no idea was happening. So the, the opening sequence on the ice, they, the, the special effects uh, supervisor brought in all these uh, mist machines to make it misty. It goes off, you know, all, on a great distance. And then Kerry Fukunaga, the director, really, really liked the look of the ice. It was a practical ice. They ended up cutting out a big chunk of the ice and putting it into a giant refrigerated uh, truck and taking it for the underwater shots from underneath the ice to capture the look of that ice. Like that kind of commitment to doing, to capturing the look of something when you're shooting it in two different ways, like you shoot the top of the ice practically in the location, and then you actually physically cut that piece, chunk of ice out, load it onto a truck that's refrigerated so you can preserve the look is really impressive to me that they went to that level of commitment to getting the look correct. Was I, When I found that out, I lost my mind. I was like, wow, that's impressive. I wonder what the line producer was thinking that day. <laughs> <laughs> He probably lost his mind just like I did. <laughs> well, from what I understand, there's an hour of visual effects shots, solid hour of VFX shots, which is a good amount uh, in a James Bond film for sure uh, when you think about it. And the sinking trawler is actually another great example of practical meets a CG. The, the trawler is on a 50-foot giant gimbal that can be submerged. And it's really stunning to see that th those shots in that sequence. And a we talk about how important it is to have the actor buy in and to get the performance. When you have something real like a giant gimbal, which are not simple to make, especially when it has to be submergible and repeatable in that sub, uh, submerging, it's all that more impressive. You look at it from a safety standpoint, like you have to construct it so the actors are never in danger, but they have to look like they're in danger. And what, once water's involved, all bets are off. Like that becomes that's where the stunts and the special effects really working together to create something amazing to have the actors in that situation and to have them be able to not only perform, but stay safe. And I think that's a testament to those two departments working together. 
it's my understanding that when a studio wants to submit a film to the Academy in the category of visual effects, they put together a reel that demonstrates some of the behind the scenes work that it took to pull something off. I think this is a good film to discuss that where the point of this visual effects in a movie like No Time to Die is to make them invisible. In other words, not having seen that reel, in theory, I wouldn't know that, that this was a visual effects contender at all. Talk to me about what you think is captured in that reel versus what we see in the final product. Yeah, it's interesting because I, this is one of the last movies I saw on the list and not because I didn't want to, it was just sort of scheduled. So it's pretty fresh. And I, I just remember sort of watching it and analyzing it and trying to figure out where that line is because again, you think James Bond, you're not gonna think visual effects. Um, you just think of machine guns coming out of headlights. And so, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really incredible. And, and Kent, you're talking about the, that trawler sequence. And I just found that captivating because, you know, again, it's just good storytelling because you just, you, you don't, you're just sort of really don't want those characters to, you know, to die. And, and, and so you're following that drama and you're going inside, outside, and it just all just feels seamless. And you're trying to figure out what's augmented and not augmented. And, and then that scene, you know, when the, how much, it's crazy how much actually is practical when the Aston Martin's kind of squirreling around with the machine guns at the beginning and, 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 and trying to figure out where that line is. And that is where your special effects people and your visual effects people are really just like working hand in hand and, and sort of playing off each other and talking to each other. So that's that's kind of where those reels are necessary, especially even for us, you know, who right. are sort of indoctrinated and, and, and sort of experienced because there, you know, like we were saying before with Free Guy, there's so many different ways to do things. Sometimes you're like, you're looking at something and you're like, oh, that's totally CG. And then when you look at it later, they're like, no, 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 we built all that. and. And so sometimes it is hard, especially when you get into certain aspects of cinematography and lighting, where if it becomes more expressive, you're trying to think, well, did they do that because it's CG and they're trying to hide that it's CG? Or did they do that because, you know, that's just the look they want. And with, with a movie like No Time to Die, which, you know, looks gorgeous, you know, th those are just aesthetic choices that they have. And um, especially in that trawler sequence, like the lighting and, and the way everything is, especially with, like when he finally escapes, you know, you know that that wide shot of trawler is obviously, you know, a CG trawler going down. They're not going to have Daniel Craig swimming out of a <laughs> sunken ship. But, I mean, but he's pretty all, tough. <laughs> I believed it. He's a tough guy. But, I mean, I, hey, clearly. But it just, it just goes, it, it just all works together. So to, to the heart of what you're asking, uh a skid there was a time in which when you submitted for visual effect you could only submit shots from the actual movie you couldn't submit um any before afters or process and in fact i think it was a more recent in the last i think 10 years that they started opening that up and i think it's great that they did to be like it's one of those things that allows a movie like no time to die to be to shine because these movies that have these invisible effects they're just as hard as the as the big you know you know tentpole movie that uh, tentpole giant explosion world building movies, and in some ways they're just downplayed. And so this addition of the real with the before and after the process stuff, I think gets them the recognition. The way they would do it before is you'd only be able to submit movies that uh, shots from the movie itself, and they had to be you couldn't edit the sound. I don't, and that's probably still to some some degree. And when you presented at the Bake Off, which is where they 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 have a list of I think nine films that they 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 whittle down to the five or that make it is that the visual effects supervisors could talk about it but now they actually show it while the visual effects supervisor talks about it which is fantastic so you get to see not only shots from the movie after that you first see this process reel while the visual effects supervisor talks about it and then you see the pro then you see the shots from the film and then they have a Q and A and so that allows that opportunity affords that opportunity. To, for a film like this to get recognition, even when they get to the Bake Off stage. That's another point too, because, you know, I belong to the Visual Effects Society, which is like a professional organization for us poor visual effects people. <laughs> and they have their own award ceremony and they have different categories. And the two, two biggest film categories are sort of like 
visual effects and then visual like supporting visual effects and so you would have no time to die would be in a separate category than like spider-man or even dune right because you know you watch dune and you're like yeah that spaceship is cg because you know there's no real spaceship like that or a movie like star wars and so those are, are different it's you know it's just a different method and a different aesthetic and all that and then no time to die everything's trying to be real and it just allows to differentiate that skill you know maybe at some point we have to do that you know as movies go on and they become more and more seamless you know where you know you could have a woody allen film that will have a lot of visual effects in it you know um just because you know maybe a location is not available so i think it's like an interesting interesting issue how do you judge between the two i was not aware that the process for selecting these films had changed of course the podcast wasn't around back then so i didn't you know follow it as closely but yeah and, and i don't know when it i don't know exactly when it happened but i do remember there was a time in which it was very strict about what you could submit and they've opened that up and and that's a great change like that's the great change that the academy branch made for the for this category the fourth film on our list is shang chi and the legend of the ten rings Production visual effects supervisor Christopher Townsend, additional visual effects supervisor for second unit Joe Farrell, senior visual effects supervisor for Weta Digital Sean Noel Walker, and special effects supervisor Dan Oliver. So Shang-Chi is an interesting movie in the Marvel Universe. They obviously are the superhero company. They took on mythology with Thor. They brought in magic with uh, Doctor Strange, and the, now they have the multiverse coming with that, space with Guardians of the Galaxy, Afrofuturism with Black Panther, the quantum world with Ant-Man, and now this is their you know, ode to the Hong Kong martial arts action film. And I'm actually really impressed with the fact that they have taken these different types of movies and been able to integrate them almost seamlessly into one universe that is sort of, I mean, it's all encompassing. Like if you were to ask me 20 years ago, do you think that Marvel will have this run of success? It's hard, I think it'd be hard pressed to pick anybody that would have selected this. And the visual effects supervisor for this film, Christopher Townsend, he's a long time visual effects supervisor for Marvel. He's been with them since Captain America, the first Avenger. He did Age of Ultron, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. At, you know, uh, he's been with them for a long time. And so to see his progression and his career is really great. And uh, when I saw Shang-Chi, when I looked at all the effects in it, and there are a lot of effects in this movie, the standout for me is the bus fight that happens in San Francisco. It is really, really impressive, both from a stunts perspective and a visual effects perspective of how they shot that on a blue screen and then comped it so it looks like the bus is traveling in San Francisco. They actually did crash 15 cars for real in making that sequence. So there is a component of it that's the exterior actual shooting plates. There's the blue screen component. There's the performance of the actors and the stunt people, which is really great. It even ties into the story with Aquafina driving the bus. They already established how she's a great driver and she's now driving this giant bus that gets cut in half. It's a tour de force because I had not seen yet at that point a great sort of superhero martial arts sequence. And it's really, really fantastic. Um, I was super impressed with that. Yeah, and it's just a great like integration, like as you say, it's a great integra- integration between visual effects and special effects, but also like story, like because this is the point where you're really introducing the character, right? This right. is who this person really is, and you know it goes down to even the music that they picked works really well, and it's just like this one beautiful seamless sequence um, that just all comes out of story, and you know how they kind of rig the bus. Uh, on stage to kind of give the the stunt performers and the actors, you know, something to real to play off of, right. right? So you have this big giant piece of machinery and they're really fighting in it. 
Um, it's on a then, gimbal. We always got to talk about the yeah, gimbal. Yeah, yeah, you always have to. Yeah, everything is about the gimbal. <laughs> and but that's how you get the the real interactions, right? Where it's like on two wheels and turning around and 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 turning and 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 pitching. Um, and so it's it's just it's a masterclass on how to introduce this character in an exciting way. Yeah, and I think that carries through in another fight in the film when they fight the fight in Macau on the scaffolding. It's another great, really well choreographed fight that uses another uh, practical set, which is the actual scaffolding, which is this big three-story scaffolding that they had rigged that could rotate and tilt 45 degrees. And so you had a combination of that classic wire work from Hong Kong, Wu Ping style, plus the superhero aspect of it that was really coming through. Um, all of Macau there was virtually created. Um, and in fact, they wanted to go shoot at a bunch of locations, but they couldn't because of the pandemic. So the original plan was to go on location in Macau to shoot plates for this sequence, and they never went to Macau. So all of Macau is was an unforeseen CG virtual environment for all of that sequence, which is pretty impressive. They were going to go to uh, New Zealand to shoot um, the compound, but they couldn't go to New Zealand. So that's all virtual. Um, the forest the, the, that that uh, that is around Tao Lo, they were going to go to Vietnam and Thailand. They had to cancel that trip and make it virtual. So that forest is all CG, you know. And the and of course moving trees around it's, would that how it have to be CG? But to have no real practical element in there is really impressive. And again, shows the the one of the challenges of visual effects is pivoting, and it's the challenge in filmmaking as a whole. You know, Skid, you probably have many days where you had to pivot, make different decisions. And and that is one of the tricks that people don't realize who don't work in the film industry is how much things change and you have to react on the day. And in the case of visual effects, you've budgeted for these certain things. And now you have to go out of the budget and plan for something else and try to find a way to like bring it back in scope to get the movie done. And I think Chris Townsend did a great job with this, considering the challenges he had. I would never have known that watching the movie that these things were what, what he faced uh, while he was making it. It's like, it's really impressive. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a good point. Like this is definitely a pandemic movie and how it looks is good and how everything kind of turned out the way it did, especially with a lot of the practical stunt work is a testament to them. Um, I'd also like to talk about the, that sort of water map sequence. Oh yeah. Super. That's pretty, really nice. Yeah. It was really well done. And, it's beautiful and, and unexpected, you know, and and so I think something like that, that really sort of speaks to me when it's just like something unusual and sort of design driven and sort of taking an element that we all know, like water and sort of doing something interesting and special. It speaks to the magic of, of the whole world. Right. And it's it's it feels grounded in that you feel like that room is a real room that grounds that effect in that room itself, which I think helps with all the refraction that's happening through all the beads of water that are super challenging from a rendering standpoint, that you have to have enough of that room in there to like get all of that reflection and refraction correct with all the ray tracing that happens there. Um, one interesting thing I found out, so of course... We talk about previs. There was a lot of pre-visualization, meaning computer-generated planning of sequences of action sequences. But one thing that they did on this film, and I saw this in in their reel, was toy viz. Mm -hmm. So the stunt coordinator had been in the states and had to go back to Australia, and was quarantined in his hotel room, and but still had to work on the movie. And so, for some odd reason, he had a Chris Evans Captain America action figure, and I guess Stan Lee one. And he used his like, I think phone camera to like set up shots and then would send them to the VFX supervisor, you know, online so that they could evaluate shot work. And they had this whole toy viz reel of like shots they designed while they couldn't get out of, you know, quarantine, which I think again shows the, the, uh, that necessity is the mother of invention or reinvention uh, action figure toy viz was used on this film, which I think is a funny thing to think about as a as a sidebar on this one and earlier this on this talk we talked about face replacements there are 250 face replacements in this film and most of them were mar the martial arts fighting sequences and what's interesting that 
that happened in during that time and what Chris Townsend, the VFX supervisor, talks about is the fact that they had these great stunt performers who were ex- who were literally exerting themselves while trying to do these very difficult moves. And that information that happened on their face was translated into the deep fake rather than having the actor try to redo their performance. And, and in general, actors aren't trying to act like the martial artists. They're trying to act like their character and they may not be accounting for how it's really happening. They're trying, they're doing their best. But the deep fake actually took the performance of the stunt person and put it on the actor, which gets into this real gray area of performance and whose performance is it. But it sells the performance, which I think is something that should be noted in terms of like how the deep fake may enhance an effect and make it more immersive for the audience because the audience can sense that when something is replaced sometimes because the performance doesn't match the exertion. And that was an interesting observation by Chris Townsend when he talked about using deep fake technology on this film. It's great to get the stunt performers performance finally up on screen more, right? Maybe get recognized by the Academy someday. Someday, someday. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even talk about the dragon and monster fight. Like these Marvel films get so big now that like, the end of the world or the giant scope that happens. And there's this, you know, artic- fully articulating Chinese style dragon that flies around that fights another beast in there that features Shang-Chi and another character running up the backs while that's going on, like in water that's flying around everywhere. Like you're talking a super challenging in a virtual world. It's like you're just adding up what you have to do. And it, bec- it be- by nature, that's all CG. The whole shot's, a CG shot. Like there's, I don't think there's a way you could shoot that in Marvel cinematic language. And here we are talking about Marvel, the next two films, this film and the next one are both Marvel cinematic universe films. There is a, almost a house style to the visual effect. It's hard to describe. It's more of like an idealized looking visual effect to some degree. Um, and it's hard. It's difficult. I think for, for the movies to stand out as much from each other because they have, it's not a constraint, but it's a, it's a rule almost that you're living in this world. They have to live together, right? And so it's an interesting conundrum. Marvel movies have been nominated several times and they've never won, yet the visual effects are astounding. Like there is no question that the quantity of effects, the lift of that alone is outstanding and hard. And they don't, they, they, they have a look that maybe is co- continuous through them, but the effects are different. What they're trying to do in Shang Chi is different from what they look in what they look like in Black Panther, or what they look like in the next film, Spider Man: No Way Home. And there is merit to that. I think sometimes it does get overlooked because of the fact that the Marvel universe is so all encompassing. Yeah, and I think that's probably that's probably the challenge, you know, it would, especially with Marvel movies or or Star Wars movies, because it, it does sometimes become more quantity you know over over i wouldn't say quality because they're always looking great but just like how it stands out right um and so you know it it just sort of gets glossed over i think by the greater community yeah but the achievement is certainly high like you and and that's the the award is best achievement in visual effect and like that shouldn't just go unnoticed in my opinion like they're like the, the, the world building of the Marvel Cinematic Universe alone, I just listed off at the beginning of this, this, this particular movie, all the different almost genres they've encompassed and successfully done so where like an audience buys. I mean, like, it's a lot of different worlds to sort of bridge and to feel like it's unified. I don't think that's easy to do at all from a design, a visual effects design perspective. Well, that might be a good segue into the final film on our list. Spider-Man No Way Home, production visual effects supervisor Kelly Port, visual effects supervisor for Sony Pictures Imageworks, Chris Wagner, visual effects supervisor for Digital Domain, Scott Edelstein, and senior special effects supervisor for Marvel Studios, Dan Sudik. That's the second Dan Sudik film, longtime Marvel uh, uh, associated uh, special effects uh, supervisor for Dan Siddick. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with him on the first Iron Man film. He is a veteran and a really nice person too at the same time, so which you, you always like to be able to say that. Um, Spider-Man No Way Home uh, generally should be recognized as the giant blockbuster of last year. It, it's an, 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 There's no asterisk around that. Like there is absolutely none. And, uh, and uh, you could argue 
it's as if the pandemic never happened as far as that film goes. And there's an achievement there. There are 2,400 visual effects shots in that film. That's probably the film that has the most effects in terms of shot count. Um, there are 12 different vendors who worked on this film. And the I think the mirror dimension, which is the Doctor Strange magical aspect of the film is outstanding. Like the seeing the world, it's like, I remember when Doctor Strange was first being discussed um, and I had friends on that film and they said, it's like Inception, but on steroids. And that's a very good description of the sort of the mirror dimension that exists there. I mean, there one of the interesting from a technology standpoint um, is that Framestore had a procedural city system. So what that means is that it builds it on the fly. Like so you say, for example, I want to be on Fifth Avenue at this point in the city. It can actually generate the buildings in that street, on that street, so they're, they're accurate to where they are. And then you can, on top of that, let an animator fold that building in that street on top of itself. I mean, that is an amazing effect. It's not easy to bold and bend rigid geometry and have it hold up. So that's all of New York had the system at Framestore. I think that's really um, as, as a super innovative and um, an amazing sequence. And obviously they had to invent this or devise this technology to be able to achieve that effect. It has just from an effects, the sheer effects number on a standpoint, we talked about the shot count, like you've got the dust, you have the basically returning heavy hitters of all of Spider-Man coming back. You've got the dust of Sandman. You have the reptilian uh, creature of the lizard. You've got the green goblin back here, Doc Ock with his CG tentacles. Um, all of those characters return with their effects. Even if they were done years ago, they had to pay homage to, they can't just make the effect look different. They had to go back and look at those movies to recreate those effects in today's times. And the thing that people don't realize is the amount of de-aging work that that movie required. Like there's extensive de-aging work on Alfred Molina and Willem Dafoe because they were much younger when they did those Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, right? So they had to go in there and make them look younger. And you don't even think about it when you're watching the movie. It's just like you accept it. It's happening. That's what they are, right? And so- even in this film with a ton of what you know are visual effects shots, there are some invisible effects that most people don't even think about. I mean, for the Sandman character alone, there were three different vendors. There was uh, Luma and Sony Pictures Image Works that did the sort of the spinning uh, uh, giant effect of, of Sandman. But then there's DD who did the humanoid aspect of the Sandman character. You know, so you have multiple vendors doing different aspects of the character of the villains at the same time. And coordinating all of those processes is a feat unto itself. Like when I think about trying to make sure that the look of the film is unified across all these other stu all these studios, it's it's mind boggling that you could maintain. They all have different renderers. They all have different character rigging systems and they might be able to share the model, but the shaders almost always are some proprietary shader system that goes with their lighting package. You know, whether they render an Arnold or Redshift or Render Man or any of these other rendering softwares, they have to recreate and keep a look that that doesn't jump from shot to shot. Like that's not simple to do. It's a very complicated process. And they're all in different parts of the world. So you're coordinating all of this at some central location in Los Angeles, trying to make sure that as you get plates and footage in and you're distributing the work that they're all sort of staying unified. And that's where the visual effects supervisor really comes into play is to make sure that all of these different vendors are like hitting the same target. Um, I think that's notable that Sony Pictures Image Works is one of the vendors on this show. They were the original Spider-Man, uh, go back to Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, they were the original vendor for Spider-Man. And so it's nice to see them come back again on this film. I know it's a Sony movie and it's almost a guarantee that if Sony's making a movie, SPI or Sony Pictures Image Works will come back and do the effect. But it's, you know, for me as somebody who's a fan of, of superhero movies and I remember going to see Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 and to see them come back and work on this was, is actually pretty great. Chris, you were What about Spider-Man Spider 3? 3? I was going to say, You worked on Spider-Man 3. <laughs> you didn't go see Spider-Man 3? <laughs> I did come see Spider-Man 3. And come like, on, we have, man. We have a veteran here of Spider-Man Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it was amazing to see Sandman come back. So, you know, I did, um, yeah, it was almost two years on uh, Spider-Man 3. Um, it was a wild experience. It was very fun and crazy movie and a very big movie at the time. And so it's interesting to see what they've done with Sandman 15 years later. 
right? Because, you know, in visual effects world, that's like, what, six <laughs> generations? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and so just the sort of believability of that character. And so, because I, you know, I like Thomas Hayden Church. He's a good actor. And um, this, and, and he was sort of the, that tortured soul villain and be able to kind of read that, you know, in, in his face is a, is a great achievement. I think the, the Liberty Island sequence is probably the crowd pleaser. Um, and I think SPI worked on that one. And it's it was it, to have the three different Spider-Mans battling all these villains. I, 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 part of me is like, how, where is this all going to go? Because the escalation of like activity in these Marvel movies just keeps getting larger and larger. Like, it's crazy. I mean, like, you had where, the, where the do they Thanos park snap? all their trailers? <laughs> 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 like, let star studded, like, how many people are in that with Toby and, and, and everybody and Tom Holland now? Yeah, it's a real feat. And you know that they have a ton of digi doubles because they're, they're doing impossible things. Like, you're, uh, you know it intellectually that they're digi doubles, but you don't think about it while you're watching the film. I think that that's, that, you know, says a lot about the staying power of all three of their versions of the characters. But from a visual effects standpoint, making digital doubles of humans is still hard. It's not a simple process. And they're doing, to, to Chris's point about Dune, they're doing impossible things that you intellectually know no one can do. You know, and I think to keep engaged with the story and not have it feel like, oh, I'm in another CG fest is not a simple proposition by any measure to, to, at that point. You know, so I think it's really impressive, not just from a sheer volume standpoint, but uh, by the success of the effect itself, I think is, is super uh, impressive to me. Every time I every time I see these films, part of me is in awe of the film itself and part of me has a headache thinking about like, what if I was on that film? What would I, have, like, <laughs> how would I have been able to wrangle all of that work? Or how would I have been able to previs those sequences and how much time would it have taken to go through and really sort of do it? Yeah. I know that they did extensive previs on the pre-visualization that is on the Liberty Island fight, but they handed it over from what I understand is they handed it over to image Rook sooner than they did in other movies because it's so animation intensive that they wanted the animators to get their hands on the shots sooner and work more interactively with editorial, which, so this is a, for me, a, a new or interesting development is that pre-visualization is, is like making a blueprint or an early version of a sequence to guide not just the visual effects, but like the stunts and, and sort of the practical side of it as well. Um, how are we going to shoot this movie? What's going to be CG? What's going to be practical? But to involve the anim character animators sooner, I think, is actually a great thing. It shows the advancement in technology. The reason why you would hire another company to do previs is they're generally faster at generating the work. But like to be at the point where the animators can be fast enough to work interactively or like day by day with editorial to help do the changes, I think that's an impressive moment in animation and character animation for visual effects that they can get to that, that point where they can be interactive and still be productive and that, i think that that was something i had read and heard about and uh i would love to know more about how that worked. Like, yeah it's an interesting i mean because it, it sort of speaks to spider-man it's you know it's he was always really hard to to pre because you're trying to work fast but there's such a physicality and they're like so iconic poses and movement with him that it gets very specific and which drives the camera so right. if you're trying to plan a shot and you don't have the movement right then your shot's wrong and that's probably the impetus to get it to the animators sooner so if this shot's going to be mostly cg anyways yeah then you want that movement and to be able to kind of seamlessly go from full CG Spider-Man to stunt to actor, you know? And, and so the animators can hit the ideal and the impossible that are, that the audience wants this superhero to hit. Um, and then we can kind of figure out and backtrack from there where to, where to sort of hand off. Going back to something that we've been, that's thematically been talking about throughout this, this uh, podcast is the integration of, you know, practical with the visual effect. And where that shows up is interactive lighting with magic. So of course, Dr. Strange is in here, got lots of magic, making portals. Even, even Spider-Man's best friend is making portals. And to see the light, you know, in order to buy it, you have to feel like the light is either in the room or shining on the characters. And that's 
working with practical and working with the DP to make sure that we end that the gaffers that they end up lighting the characters or the actors so that you can put the effect in there in a convincing manner. Like that's something that is super important in the sort of, in the, the shooting of the effect before you actually get to put it in. You know, following up on that magic idea, do you guys see any challenges in developing techniques or a style in Dr. Strange and then Another studio, Sony, is going to do this Spider-Man movie with Doctor Strange. And then we have the Multiverse of Madness with Doctor Strange coming out. Do you think that's a seamless transition back and forth? Or are there challenges just involved in handing off the concept or the technology or the style of these three films? You just have to talk to Victoria Alonso. Uh (laughs) The keeper of the keys to the kingdom. The executive at Marvel Studios, Victoria Alonso, really is in charge of visual effects and post-production and a bunch of other things. She is spinning every plate you can imagine and actually is quite, and I won't even say good, is excellent at yeah, doing yeah. so. She, I think that's, yeah. that's, that's one of the reasons. But it's to go specifically to that question, it's not easy. It's not a simple process. To, oh, we're just going to use the same mirror tools and mirror dimensions. If the, if the vendor who did the original is not available, then you have to recreate that effect. You have to research it. You have to figure out your method of doing it with your tools and or hire artists that worked on the previous one, look at all the reference and really catalog those things so that the movies live together seamlessly. I think that that as the universe expands and expands, it becomes more and more challenging to like find each effect and also just make each effect unique in a way. Like would you want it, you don't want them to be a rehash, right? You have to escalate or, you know, do what hasn't been seen before to take something that you see in a film and make it something else. I think it's hard to do. You definitely saw like, for example, in the Iron Man heads up display, which I have some personal experience with, which I worked with on the first film, the first Iron Man film, there is an evolution to that graphic interface, the heads up display and different companies have done it. And so you have to go through and even, let's even just look at the UI, the blatant UI, just UI design for shield, any, object that gets that like what does that look like or ui design for all the space stuff like all of the guardians of the galaxy have some kind of ui design from foreign planets like you know like you have all this these these rules that you're establishing of how things look on these different films like you have to somehow bring them all back together again and have them feel right all of tony's tech as it evolved like how tony got in the suit it's actually kind of amazing how much it changed tony stark getting into an iron man even though he's not in this film but like it speaks to the evolution of ideas across multiple films. And I think that gets back to sort of what you're talking about, Skid, is like you have magic. So you introduce magic in Doctor Strange, but then you see it again in some of these other films, like, like the Avengers movies or like, you know, like these last few Avengers movies. And now here it is in Spider-Man, you know, he's going to get his own, his second standalone film, the you know, Multiverse of Magic comes out this year. What are they going to do to make it unique in that movie? Are they going to escalate it in some way, shape, or form? And you also include the TV stuff, too. Like, there's a lot to consider. Yeah, it's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, um, again, it just goes to, you know, why it's been nominated to it. That's part of it. It's just seamless. Like, you see Doctor Strange and his magic, and you just know what it is, and it looks flawless, you know, from one film to the next. So, you know, it, that's that's why we're sort of recognizing it, right? And also the influence of the animated film. Right? We we haven't even talked about the fact that the the fact that there is a multiverse at all. Well, I'm sure in the comics there's a multiverse, but the fact that what opened it up was the success really of Into the Spider Verse, the animated film, really explores the idea of the multiverse first before it really got hot, you know, and from a cinematic standpoint. And they even use those concepts here. In a, in a way that was super innovative in that film. And so I, I think that that's fascinating that even the animated side of it is inc- somehow included in the cinematic universe. Yeah. You know, before we wrap up this part, Chris, you, you kind of said it in passing, but the fact that you worked on Spider-Man 3 15 years ago, talk to me more about watching this film, both from what you know of what you did then, and obviously the technology has changed, but also what you were watching for and your expectations, again, understanding some of the earlier work on these characters. Yeah, it's such, I mean, the, the experience of working on on the Spider-Man 3, um, you know, it was fun. It was very hard work, a very difficult film. 
to do. So I understand because you have a lot of different characters. Um, and Spider-Man three was sort of criticized with like too many villains, right? And so you know, here is a movie that is specifically about that and um, how they're sort of pulling that off. And you, you have to sort of bring back all these legacy characters, both in a writing standpoint, but also like visual effects wise, like we were talking about is how do you bring Sam M back and not just redo what you've done, but like it has to hold up for 2022 or 2021 rather. And um, so how do you how do you do that? How do you make it like recognizable and feel like the same character, but also look contemporary? And, you know, also with like Jamie Foxx's character, I think really looked a lot better, you know, and, and sort of really kind of rocketed forward. And so, that, you know, that was an interesting thing to, to, to kind of do. And then, you know, and, and from a personal standpoint too, you know, it's just in a different place in my life back then um and so you you know here because this one it was interesting because i went and and took my kids who weren't born you know uh when <laughs> when i worked on the first one and when the first one came out and there's so, nothing that makes me feel more young than that right chris <laughs> well yeah exactly but it kind of does actually because i got to instead of like looking at it as like like maybe a jaded old visual effects artist um, and just sort of picking it apart. You're watching it with your two young sons and sort of just enjoying it all. And, you know, they recognize some of the characters that they've seen before. Um, you know, there's Green Goblin's back and, and it's like, oh, you know, and then oh, Doc Ock. And so it's really fun and see how they kind of innovate these characters too with the, you know, you know with Doc Ock's, you know, the, the limbs, which are before were, they, were, they did a lot practically in the second one in the second Sam Raimi one. And here they, they're able to do it all CG and it's very seamless and, and you can get such more interesting and expressive performances um, you know, out of it. And you have to be very careful because you have an actor there um, and it has to feel like he's controlling those arms and, and he has to react to them and, and what they're doing and the, and the weight of them and all that stuff. So that's very, that's, that's very difficult to think. So if you have a practical um, apparatus that the actor's wearing, it's something that they can react to and, and feel the weight of. Um, but then you have to come up with different, different ways to do that if it's completely CG. Well, tell me, gentlemen, are there any other 2021 films that you thought were noteworthy for visual effects? You know, I'm, I, I'm a sucker for a Godzilla movie. So I, I'll be honest, I, you know, I get it. I know that I've heard the criticism about the Godzilla films, but I grew up, but the first film I saw in a movie theater was Godzilla versus Megalon, hashtag Toho films. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I loved seeing Godzilla. On, I love seeing Godzilla on the big screen. And it's impressive to me on a level of like seeing him fight King Kong, even though they're so big, it's almost absurd that they're fighting. And then to see Mecha Godzilla sort of in, in, in that film. I, I, I had a good time at the movies just watching that. And I enjoyed that experience of watching those, those Titans fight each other. Um, I think, I, I can't believe how many shots there are in that kind of film and how they fight on top of an aircraft carrier. Uh, but I think it's fun. I'd have to say Macbeth, you know, it was nominated in the Visual Effects Society. Um, and just because it's like, interesting and has a great look to it and it's again one of these that's world building but it's not the typical laser battle thing but there's just some beautiful gorgeous shots that are just impossible but they've done it you know uh with the three sisters and the reflection and it's just like they're really thinking about expressive ways to can reconvey shakespeare it's just a fun one yeah i have to say that the, that film with its cinematography is that we talked about integration of the departments, the cinematography in that film is just beautiful. And it's, it's almost minimalism in the look really add to that enjoyment of the visual effect in that film. Like the, the, it, it's just stands out as a, as a stylized yeah, effect. Yeah. And it that it, it reminds great. me, I mean, obviously it harkens back to the Orson Welles version um, and the sort of German expressionist, um, those set, those. Oh, now you're going all film school. <laughs> I know, just those minimalist sets that they've done, you know, which is just, it's great because you can put on a Shakespeare movie 
and you're not spending a lot of money, but it looks awesome. And I think these guys are, it's, it's very similar where you get a lot of scope, you know, through this method. Well, Chris, I'm glad you brought uh, that film into this conversation. Kent, I'm not sure that I feel as fondly about Godzilla versus Kong. What? Uh, or even, I, even that movie came out last year. <laughs> but I could, but I do appreciate you loving it and uh, bring in that affection here. Guys, you brought it all together. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having us, Kid. It's really great. Yeah, thanks, Kid. This was a lot of fun. Listeners, that's a wrap. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, please visit our website, below the line, one word, dot biz. It's B I Z. It's easy to peruse past episodes, and you'll find links to all of our social media. That includes our page on IMDb, where, as I mentioned earlier, you can learn more about my guests. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and all of you for sticking with us. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts, and tell your friends if you can catch the 10th and final episode of this year's Oscar series on Thursday. Thanks again from Below the Line.